for those who are new to this this human, Hugh Newman. He is a host of Megalithomania Annual Conference. He is a crop circle investigator, a author of uh, a book called Earth Grids and some books about giants. So before we get into all this stuff about giants, which is what I want to talk to you about, briefly, because I'm curious, I read your, your book about earth grids and, uh, and, and I also love visiting crop circles and every time I go look at different crop circles, what I see are your photos on all of the different crop circle websites. So, so before we get into the giants, I just want to ask you, so, so earth grids, what, what, what's the deal going on there? We have grids of like energy lines on the earth and also on other planets. What the hell are they? What, what, what do we do with them? Why do we care about them? What, what, what's going on with all of that? Yeah, the, yeah, the earth grids thing, that is, that is actually, through crop circles, I got into that subject. It really is based upon the idea of like the earth mysteries, like ley lines, uh, earth energies. I'm very interested in things like cymatics and the way that kind of we interact with these sites specifically, you know, like, because I always felt like there was some kind of effect people get when they visit ancient sites. I always got that and I always looked out for that. And still to this day, I have very strange things happen, whether it's very scary kind of hauntings or whether it's like enlightening kind of light filled experiences. And I think when you're looking at the, the concept of earth grids, it covers many different subjects. There's not just like one like earth grid around the planet with all these lines connecting up with this energy system. I think there's more to it than that. There's, there's elements we don't understand. There's a, a global kind of sense of this magnetic field and the way that gets manipulated by the movement of the sun and the different planets and it kind of forms really into this kind of cymatic effect around the planet and I think that that's something that's often overlooked and that affects us and that affects the ancient people who were building these sites and trying to manipulate this energy from the magnetic field from the telluric currents from the natural yang chi earth energies that occur on the planet also the underground water and also they were masters these ancient builders I believe of manipulating the weather I think that was one of their skill sets. That's one of the things we go into in the new book, actually, the whole Sowers of Thunder mythos. And so when you look at earth grids, it's really like, um, it's like a concept. You know, there's, there's, there's many different angles to look at it from. Okay, but so, so when you're saying energy grids, you're talking about magnetic sort of lines within the earth. Is this something we can actually measure? Is it something that, you know, uh, orthodox science understands and can measure? Or is this, is this something very different? Well, yeah, I mean, orthodox science can measure like telluric currents. They're, they're linked with the magnetic field and they kind of surge and increase in the morning when the sun rises. They become stronger and like thicker and they move across the landscape. And often that's what wakes us up in the morning. Mm. And, and then they, they decrease in strength at night and become thinner and smaller, almost disappear into nothing. But these telluric currents, uh, exist like three feet below the surface and just above the surface so these are real things it's all documented and the fact is it's not really talked about no one really discusses it but it's a well-known kind of thing that's been observed i believe for thousands of years people have been able to sense this through not just their body but through dowsing um through psychic means and other such things because it affects the glands in the brain it affects you can feel like kind of shivers in your body yeah, and and dowsers basically can pick these up quite easily. There's even there's, there's technologies can there's there's apps on your phone that can do it now, and so yeah, this is well known, but it's just not really talked about. I mean, because it was more of a kind of because it's invisible, it's often not discussed. That's basically it. Okay, um, and so they do they tie in with crop circles and also w w with crop circles. I know obviously you, you seem to be an expert on them because you're photographing them everywhere. What, what's your take on them? Because they're absolutely perfect. well. Yeah, I mean the, the prehistory of crop circles is really interesting, and it, in more recent times, I know for a fact many of them are man-made. That that's that's just a fact nowadays. It's like in a way these people who make them they're, they're fantastic artists. They're continuing a tradition, but there are some anomalies. There are ones that no one claims to have made them. There's a prehistory that goes back literally hundreds of years all over the world. And there's no way people were hoaxing them then, you know, for sure. And so 
when it was a kind of big thing in the 80s and 90s, there was scientific tests done on some of the circles. And they proved, you know, through scientific means and te technologies that some kind of electromagnetic energy was heating up the stems and increasing the kind of uh, nodes, sort of expanding them, blowing them up almost, burning them out in some cases. So it's some kind of energy was causing that, some kind of microwave or electrical or magnetic kind of intensity and so that kind of that's what got me interested in this and then i realized they were often linked with these sacred sites these megalithic sites always in the same landscape especially around here in wiltshire and so yeah when you look at it from that perspective you you realize there's something subtle going on that's been observed for hundreds of years but nowadays the complicated ones and everything else there's a lot of man-made ones one of the things that really interested me was the work of John Burke and Kaj Halberg who worked for the BLT research team in Boston and they were analyzing crop circles and were noticing these blown nodes but also where the crop circles had appeared one year the following year they would notice that the crops would grow more abundantly like the like the land had been affected like the seeds the crops had actually been affected by whatever energy or these what they think were these spheres of light which have often been witnessed in films that created them and, and so there's a very strange phenomena which links with fairy lore as well which is a whole other thing so, so that's what i was going to ask is when you say these balls of light that created them is it the earth that's creating them? is it aliens ufos fairies what, you know, what, what's your take well this is this is one of the really frustrating aspects of when you're studying anything kind of paranormal is there's an element of what's what Patrick Harper called daemonic reality. John Michelle spoke about this as well, where you never quite get the answers. You get near to the answers and then the, another level of complexity emerges and you're back to square one. And so this is one of these. This is like the UFO phenomenon. This is like the Bigfoot. This is like fairies uh, or witches and things like that. You never quite get the answer. So I think the same principles are at play with these balls of light because they appear intelligent, you know. And uh, we, we, to be honest with you, we've seen stuff around here, you know, directly. I've seen stuff myself. JJ's seen it. When you say stuff, you're talking about balls of light? Balls of light, strange movements through the landscape and things like this, electrical activity around sites. Um, for, for context, for people listening, by the way, we are literally right next to Stonehenge, maybe what, a couple hundred meters away or something like that. Yeah, about, about, about half a mile, but we're, we're literally, we're next to one of the mounds. I mean, we're in the Stonehenge landscape, right in the heart of it here. We're, I mean, my the address here is, you know, part of the Stonehenge landscape complex kind of thing. So, so yeah, so there's a lot of strange stuff going on here for obvious reasons but also places like Avebury and all over the country really and so you've got to kind of question um, what is going on I mean why are these balls of light being filmed I mean what really are they I mean they could be elemental beings there's so much talk about this in the prehistory especially in Ireland and places like this but also we get it everywhere. There's there's these stories of these strange lights and circular kind of things occurring in the crops all over the world, fairy rings and so forth. And so yes, yeah, so I think there's a lot more of this to the meets the eye. But trying to trying to kind of pin it down as to exactly what it is, I think will always elude us. So so when we're talking about this um this uh, realm of other things, you're talking about fairies and pixies and aliens and whatever. So you've written a book. Well, now two books about giants, and the new one's just come out, by the way, for people listening. Uh, please check out the book. There's the book. That's the one. <laughs> so, so you've written a book about giants. Now, now we were talking about fairies and whatever. So before I, I read your book, my concept and understanding of giants, I sort of was, was something uh, mythical. Um, I, I lumped them in with, uh, you know, werewolves and vampires and, and, and uh, you know, zombies and unicorns and all that kind of stuff. So, so when you decide to look into this, you know, you go on Google, you start looking at giants, what you get are images of hoaxes, just endless yes. hoaxes. And, and, you know, there was this Photoshop competition uh, a while ago where people were putting, uh, you know, images of, of giants in the ground and, and that's what spread all around. And so obviously there's a lot of bad reporting about that out there. Some people saying there's giants, but they're just nonsense websites, just, you know, just basing off Photoshop competitions and stuff. So, so your book has hundreds of reports of, of uh, well, reports of skeletons mainly. And uh, they're mostly from contemporary newspapers from, you know, through the 19th century. So why should we believe their reports? Why not assume that they're all also hoaxes and, you know, part of some fantasy like unicorns? 
Yeah, that's no, a good. That's a good question. There's like uh, well, in North America specifically. I mean, in the book we cover in our previous book, Giants on Record, we've got 250 accounts we put in the book. We had probably at that time. 1200 accounts now we have nearly 2000 and we're not just talking newspapers we're talking antiquarian journals archaeological reports the smithsonian's own archaeologists digging stuff up reporting on up to eight foot tall skeletons we have some that are on display in places like the maryland um, museum and universities and we have numerous like obscure town and county histories that report these doctors and surgeons examining these skeletons that have been dug out of a mound nine feet tall and they're measuring them and they're just put them in the back end of this tiny local book that no one's ever going to find apart from us um, in these obscure libraries and archives and so why would they do that you know this is one of the big questions and also we have literally you know tens maybe dozens of accounts of actual kind of photos when they were on display you know, and then the problem is the Smithsonian disappeared, most of them. And this is part of a, a, a lengthy agenda to li link with Manifest Destiny, the theory of evolution emerging, religious beliefs and so forth. But also in 1990, we have the NAGPRA Act, the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, uh, came into force where the indigenous Native Americans working with the federal government basically got all their grave goods, skeletons, any bones that were on display anywhere to rebury them in a sacred manner, which is a good thing, you know, don't get me wrong, but it also a problem for us, giantologists, we call ourselves, we couldn't, all the evidence disappeared with that. But we know that there's a huge amount of academic data that we, we compiled. If you just look at the academic data and the measurements and the discoveries, that's enough to, to push this open and to, to you know, get them to explain this in the mainstream, but they never will and never have. And so, you know, the fact is that there's just too many accounts. And like there's, it, it, we, we realized with working with people like Ross Hamilton, who's written a book called The Tradition of Giants, Jeffrey Wilson and a few other authors and researchers that there's something going on and like it's not been documented. And we, and we just became compelled to investigate why is this being covered up? But, but obviously you find all these accounts, but, <clears throat> but we've got to examine the credibility of them. So, so are they all clustered in one area? Is it just a bunch of farmers getting together and, and, and you know, getting in on a hoax together for some famous success? It, it, could it be that? And then also the newspapers that were reporting them, uh, were they, were they, did they have high journalistic standards? Were they also reporting vampires and unicorns? I mean, you know. Well, <laughs> no, no, this, yeah, that's, fine. That's, a, that's a fair question. No, no, this was like New York Times, Los Angeles Times. These were like major national newspapers at the time. There was obviously a lot of local papers as well. But we're talking about um, obscure diaries we found and things like that from academics that were describing what they found in detail, measuring everything. And so we cut, you know, can you dismiss those as just like, are they going to make that up and never to publish it? And so, you know, we, we you know, we, we leave it up to the reader to decide on the authenticity. We're just trying to, we investigate every account to its core the best we can. Sometimes it's a dead end, you can't go any further. Sometimes the Smithsonian disappeared them, others got taken by NAGPRA. And so we don't, we're not pushing an agenda. We don't, you know, we're not 100% sure of all these discoveries, but we document the most authentic, we feel, ones and put those in the book. But, but like, for example, with, with the farmers, is it, is it just one area? Is it spread out through the whole country? Oh, yeah, the whole country. No, it's, it's the entire country of North America that we investigated. From one, you know, from Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts, up in Maine, all the way down to Catalina Island on the, in the far kind of southwest regions of California. So every area, and, uh, and we're talking thousands of miles distance when there was no communication, there was no post. There were no trains, nothing like that at the time. All of these reports coming out in local areas. And so, we, you know, you have to take notice of that, especially as the Native Americans themselves were already talking about this. They were talking about these giants. They, they were aware of them. They were their ancestors. They were also describing an earlier group of people. They didn't know who they were had arrived in the area and terrorized them and things like this. So, to, so we look at mythology as well uh, and we're finding pa parallels 
across the entire country, not just in the mythology, but also in the discoveries and the descriptions. They're almost identical, some of them. And, 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 but, you know, again, in, in terms of credibility, okay, so you've got a bunch of farmers, you've got some newspapers re reporting that. Are there any figures from history that, that, that stand out that, 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 you know, are esteemed and well-regarded? Yeah, no, well, there's a lot. Uh, the names are all in the book. I forget, forget some of the names, but we have uh, probably... 25 well-known academics in universities that are reporting on this, uh, doctors and surgeons. Some of the early presidents uh, reported on discovering bones and skeletons, as well as meeting actual seven and a half foot tall Osage or Osage Indians, you know, at the time. And uh, they were kind of blown away with these people they were just meeting. Uh, we have many of the early explorers as well. Uh, we have Sir Francis, um, Drake. Francis Drake, we have uh, Magellan down in Patagonia, we have numerous like John Smith up in the kind of um, Carolinas and so forth. And what were those guys saying, Francis Drake and Miguel and John Smith? Yeah, no, they, they were just they were meeting them directly. And when, when you say them, what were they meeting? What? They were meeting very, very tall Native Americans up to seven, eight feet tall. There was a nine foot, I mean, they claim to have met nine foot kind of giants in, in the 1500s. This is where, you know, we document this quite clearly in the book. And I can't imagine they would lie or exaggerate. But again, we leave it to the reader to kind of make their own decisions because we're just documenting what we find. And, and so, so, you know, when we're talking about giants, obviously you've written these books about giants. What, 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 how big are we talking when we say giants? Is it seven foot? Are these 100 foot Godzillas? You know, what, 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 what kind of size what kind of size are we talking about? Here? Now, well, in, a, in a giants on record, we cover being seven foot and 18 foot. But the 18 foot one is a bit dodgy. We're not sure about that. But generally, and this is, I've, I've talked to like um, people like Dr. Greg Little about this in detail. He's looked into this as well. And he, we're talking seven to nine foot is the realistic kind of size range we're dealing with here. And we're talking like not pituitary gigantism, not acromegaly, nothing like that. Genuine genetic giants who are just this big um, uh, found throughout America, focused heavily in the Ohio, West Virginia area. That's where the real hub is. And, and the, the biggest reputable report, I mean, you said an 18 foot is-, is The 18 foot one, we're not sure about, uh, but, but it's quite it, it's quite fun to put it in the book. We put it in there anyway. I think that's from Texas. Oil, Oil City Times, 1870. Yeah, that's, that's the one, yeah, yeah. And uh, But there are a few 12 footers that, that are very kind of, you know, mentioned that are really clearly written and described and measured. And we're like, hang on a sec, you know. That, that, that's kind of intriguing. And, and when you say the, these twelve footers, you're talking is this is this uh, reputable sources, New York Times, Smithsonian, that kind of thing? Or, or, or is that... Yeah, well, I can't off the top of my head. I'd have to check my check my data in my book, but um, that's um, there were a few that were kind of surprised us up to I think eleven foot six. There was a couple that kind of seemed really reputable. There's a ten foot one I think discovered by um, a well known person in Ohio, a well known kind of academic who was quite stunned by that and uh, all the measurements kind of match someone being 10 foot i think it was a broken up skeleton so you've got things like that going on it's like but then you look at the the deep prehistory and uh we have examples of homo hydrobagensis in south africa that go back what two hundred thousand years maybe three hundred thousand years and some of these are between seven and ten feet tall I've, no, I've never heard of Homo hydrobrigensis. I don't know how you pronounce that. Yeah, yeah, is this right. a primate species? Or what yeah, is this is a predecessor to uh, the Denisovans. Uh, they were, the Denisovans are actually ancestors them. Now, it's now thought the Denisovans were giants as well. That's the kind of story. Um, and so they really intrigued. This is like, a, I think, Professor Francis Thackeray and Lee Berger, who are scientists down in the South African University, found some bones and fossilized thigh bones, which would have matched someone 10 feet tall. They're definite seven and eight footers they found down there. And so that, so that proves humans were around that big. So it kind of like, you know, removes the kind of possibility of them, you know, not being a reality that, you know, they were certainly that tall. But, but okay, so so is the it not possible or even likely that these bones that were found are Literally, you know, Gigantopithecus, or this, what do you say, Homo hydro... Blah, blah, blah. Hydrobagensis, yeah. Hydrobagensis. Uh, I don't think so. No, 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 these are like, these have been analysed. Yeah, they're, they're humanoid, yeah. So uh, they, they, they don't have, like, ape-like um, craniums. They, they have full human craniums. They're, they're I don't think so that long ago. No, not 300,000 years ago. I think they were different to us, yeah. But they, they, it just shows you that they were, you know, 
human types around you know that that height it's kind of that kind of intrigued us when we spotted that but but so i mean we know that gigantopithecus for example existed that was a 10 foot 10 foot ape it was the biggest ape i think the biggest primate um is it not possible that all of these all of these giant skeletons that have been found were actually just gigantopithecus or some other unknown ape that was maybe either you know, mistaken by the archaeologists, or perhaps even by Native Americans, they dug it up and went, "Oh God, there's some ancient king here. Let's bury him with our our dudes." No. How come? Because these were clearly humans, the ones in America. Okay. Mm. They're just definitely not primates. No, 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 because they're clearly humans. Yeah. So, 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 do they have other features that separate them from normal humans? Um, are, are they are they like just you know, are they humans completely identical to humans, but just really tall? Did they have something different about them? Not really. No, I mean there was some. We have some accounts of extremely wide, powerful jaws. That's what uh, Dr. Donald Dragoo called the Adena jaw, um, and he re there was something quite different. It was really robust, and you could almost fit it around your fa you know, a normal person's face. We have accounts of double rows of teeth, which kept coming up, or uh, supernumerary teeth, extra teeth, which is a genetic kind of throwback, and it, they, that we found many accounts of that. And, and we talked to a dental anthropologist, I think called Shara Bailey from New York University, and she, she suggested, well, actually, that's, that could happen, because once you get to a certain size, you, 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 the jaws were so big that you kind of naturally, nature would fill up the space with teeth. And so you'd get extra rows of teeth, you know, things like this. And so that was quite interesting when we spoke to her because she kind of admitted that that could be a possibility. So, so you know, with, with that being the case, are we looking at a different species or maybe a different race, you know, just through genetic mutations of Homo sapiens? Or, 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 or is this is definitely not just some random tall dudes spread out through time and space that, you know, a long no. history of burials? No, I think they're just humans, yeah. Just di different, there's lots of different types of humans today, like there were back then, I think, somewhere. I think with the, in, in North America, especially with the mound culture groups, they kind of, the elites kept themselves separate from the kind of commoners, if you like, the kind of, you know, the villages. They kept their own small villages next door and they would only breed, but, but this is what the, the kind of many of the traditions state and Ross Hamilton's kind of discussed that with us is that they would breed between themselves and other elite groups. So they would maintain their giant genes through history. Okay, so so then it's it's not so much a race. Is it a race? Would you call it a race? Is, is it just tribes, so. basically? No, I think it's just a, it's just you know, interbreeding with specific, very tall people <laughs> and maintaining those genes. I think that's what it was partly. But we have like, we have traditions in North America that go back that, that talk over time. And this is from, um, you know, various kind of Native American scholars um, that I know Ross Hamilton was involved with. And they say that even back to the time before the Younger Dryas, there was talk of this megafauna, these giant animals that would terrorize people, but there was also giant humans back then. And it was just a matter of fact thing recorded in the native traditions and the native stories about their history. And so when we kind of found out about that, we were quite intrigued. But then when after these so-called Younger Dryas or what they called the sort of dark tent, this was a period of a few hundred or a thousand years where everything went bad, dark, everything died off, the Clovis people died off and so forth. They talk about um, that the, not only did the megafauna shrink, so did the humans, and they, but only a few of the tall ones survived. And they tried to maintain their traditions for thousands of years and breed in between themselves to maintain their status as such. That's, that's the kind of loose traditions we piece together about this. There's also great battles that took place between these different peoples according to their stories. And um, there, is, there is actually archeological evidence according to our research that backs that up as well. And so it's, it's quite a profound missing chapter in you know American history. And it, it's not something just us we've been doing. There's a whole bunch of people have been going into this, coming at it from different angles, you know? So yeah, it's very intriguing. So, so, so your take on it is basically that there are a few random tall people who are possibly survivors of an ancient race of tall people and then they selectively bred and created tribes of tall people. Is that is that very vaguely? But I don't think that's because you look at the size of America. We're talking about a continent, really. We're not talking about one country. So whole areas wouldn't even have any connection with their other areas. So you can't really generalize in that sense. But certainly, in some cases, I believe so. Yeah. 
the, the thing is, though, you, you have cases going all the way down from southern Chile all the way up into, you know, way up in North America. Um, so, so is the idea that, 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 that selective breeding is what, what created these, these tribes of people? Less, that, right? that, I'm not, that I don't know about. I mean, in some cases, yeah, but in other cases, it just seems like that there were very tall people around. And like you know, not not in not 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 in the majority or anything, but they just happen to be pockets where this would occur. Where that came from, we don't know. It just is a very strange thing. But you know, you look at um, places like I went to Tonga once a few years ago, and everyone there is really tall. And I was like, wow, you know, the women, the men, everyone, the kids, everyone's taller than everyone in Britain virtually. It's like wow, and so you realise that. It, it can happen anywhere on the planet. And so it's just like one of these things. Um, but with this Denisovan stuff that's coming out, I think that's where a lot of kind of data is going to emerge, you know, and like you know, kind of prove that, that that could, because, because we're finding in North America, Denisovan DNA in like, especially the Northern areas and going into Canada, where a lot of these very early accounts of these so-called giants came from. And so, the fact is their genes appear to be linked with the giants of North America. So as far as we're aware, if you look up Denisovans now on, the, on you know, Google or whatever, we, they seem to be suggesting they're quite small people, but having giant teeth for some reason. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah. So your supposition is that they're actually, they were giants and... Uh, well, I mean, the skull fragments, the finger bones and the teeth are all extremely large. They're the, pretty much the only things they've got. And then they found this dragon skull in China, which has been around for a while, but only been reported on the last few months, really. And that's huge. That's of someone probably seven to eight feet tall. And they think that could be Denisovan. Dragon skull, did you say? The dragon man skull. Okay. Yeah, this is quite a kind of well-known thing. I know Andrew Collins and myself did a whole kind of interview about that because we were like wow what is this could that be the first Denisovan skull that's being found i know graham's talked about it as well in quite detail and so the fact is you're finding you know suddenly out of nowhere this fairly large you know someone seven eight feet tall perhaps suddenly it's there and like but they haven't they won't do any tests on it so we can't tell if it's Denisovan or not so we're, we're waiting on that we'll see what happens with that mm. Okay, so so when when the European explorers went over to North America, they were they were much shorter than they are today. I think in the book you said they were five four. They were going and seeing these Native American dudes who were probably a lot healthier, better diet, better nutrition, better lifestyle, and so they they were bigger. Could not most of the giant stories be 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 that just the sort of like looking at people who are just bigger than because they're healthier than them? Or is, is um, no 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 not really. I mean, if you look at the the kind of reports of uh, like Tuscaloosa. And his son and things like that in the, in the southern, I think the Florida, the southern areas, they were describing something quite different to just being slightly taller. Mm. Um, there was, I think, there was a case where the the, the, the tribal leader Tuscaloosa was sitting on a horse, and his feet, almost his ankles, were dragging on the ground. You know, compared to everyone else who was riding a horse normally, and so you get things like that. These little descriptions, like what, you know. But, but so, I mean, we always have tall people. Like you know, the NBA is full of they're like you know, Shaq, Yao Ming is like the seven foot nine players. Um, if you look on Wikipedia, that the, the lists twenty one people over eight feet. You know, a couple of them close to nine feet. Um, so these, the, the, I think, the percentage of people over seven foot today is the. Uh, 0.000038. So it's not very common, um, but it does happen. But they're all normal people. You know, they're not they're not giants. They're just they're just normal people who mutated. And, and often it's the case because of this, um, you know, pituitary gland issues and the human growth hormone abundance and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you were saying that you don't think it, that can explain this that these aren't just pituitary malfunctions that these are these, these are people um yeah because you got because you know generally it's I, I mean i'm not a kind of doctor or anything I, you know but from our research it's clear that these were robust fully formed naturally kind of natural dimensions of a human they weren't tall and skinny or they didn't have signs of things like what you're talking about gigantism or uh, acromegaly or anything like that there's no evidence of that in most of the 
accounts and also when these explorers were meeting them these were like robust they described them as almost like being like warrior warriors they were just perfectly formed and proportioned in every way um there's nothing there's no, nothing strange you know and like with the, a lot of these so-called basketball players they're kind of tall and skinny and that aren't there isn't any of the descriptions we get where they're tall and skinny and things like this it's quite different and so i think it's i think it's a different thing yeah quite different and we kind of concluded that in our book I mean, there are some big, also, you know, chunky guys in the NBA. Sha Shaquille O'Neal yeah. is, is a famous guy. But, I, I, yeah, they are very few and far between. So, so you know, this is a, covers a lot of time. We've got thousands of years of, of burials, potentially. So, so it's unlikely that you're saying that that, that that can account for all of these of these bodies i guess during that time there was also a lot of lower human populations yeah i mean i'm sure there were you know i'm sure there were normal sized people but in, in north america it's just it's odd there's just too many accounts it's too many reports and from obscure places and if you you, you, you look at the data and the st you know the statistics of that is quite strange it's just too many to like ignore and so you know we were just compelled by it and we thought what well, we have to report on this we have to like you know put, just put this out there as a thing and see what people think and then we have um you know, people like I said, Ross Hamilton, Dr. Greg Little, who've been researching it in America for a long time, and they're they're saying exactly the same things. So they're just like the, you know, there's giant artifacts that are being found as well, and things like this. Um, when you say artifacts, what, what, what are you yeah, talking? Giant axe heads and things. I've actually, I've actually seen some. I've actually held some before. They're absolutely ridiculous. You know, like 36 pounds. You know, way too heavy to kind of wield. You know, for a modern person. But yeah, no, we, we, we're compelled by it. We we think there's something in it. And uh, I wish it would be taken more seriously by academia because sure. it was taken seriously when it all began. The early Smithsonian people were uh, documenting it and describing, measuring and reporting in their own physical annual reports. These giant books, we've got a couple of them, Jim's got them in America, that just describe, yeah, we, we found an eight foot skeleton, we found a seven and a half foot, here are the measurements, we found it in this mound. I mean, you have some 12 foot with the Smithsonian as well. Yeah. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, but so, but this is the thing. So, so many accounts of it within the book end with, um, you know, something like that the bones were shipped back to the Smithsonian for further study. So, so you're saying you want people to take, um, you want academia to take these, this this giant thing more seriously. I think the reason they don't is because of the lack of hard evidence. There is no skeleton that we can go to refer to and say, well, there's a bloody giant. That is part of it, but there's also uh, agendas at play as well, and there have been for so, a long time. So, so, yeah, exactly. So what, what, what was going on? Why, why, why well, is that the last we hear of these skeletons that were shipped back to the Smithsonian? Well, well, the problem is, is mainly in 1990 when NAGPRA came in. That's the main thing. That, that removed anything else you know that was on display but we have agendas at play we have obviously they were championing the theory of evolution there was um smithsonian at the forefront of that actually and also we have the whole story of manifest destiny this kind of racist agenda to remove the native americans shove them onto reservations and claim they're subhuman and things like this and so when you've got these kind of things at play if you suddenly find a 10 foot skeleton with a 36 inch circumference skull with double rows of teeth found in these beautiful geometric astronomically aligned mounds it doesn't fit with what you want and you can't say go you know we're, they're clearly the incoming white people aren't superior to them these are superior people these are amazing people and so they couldn't Published that I didn't want that to be public because it didn't that means they couldn't take over the land they couldn't take over the and push these Native Americans onto reservations and things like that so you got that kind of very racist money grabbing land grabbing agenda taking place which is the fundamental root you know the kind of root cause of many of the problems in North America um, and so you've got that going on you've also got um, now they were reporting on these things for many years until a gentleman called Alice Hedlichka came in and he was um he actually was kind of into eugenics and things like that this was like before the second world war in the like early 1900s 1920s and so forth and he put a stop to it and made claims there was this claim going around that this superior race were present in north america before the native americans and who were they and they put a they put a close to that they claimed giants were no more they actually put headlines out in papers and press releases claiming giants never exist they were all mismeasurements they were all wrong you know so that when you've got like authorities like that having to put things out like that in the 1910s and 20s that raises a few questions because okay they're trying to 
close that down, but what are they closing down? And all the evidence is all there in the Smithsonian's own reports. And so, yeah, it's a very interesting kind of um, intrigue, you know, going on here. So the guy's name? Of, uh, Ailes Hedlichka. Hedlichka. So, so I think in the book you were talking about him possibly being a white supremacist and it's also... Um, in a manner of speaking, a eugenicist. He was into eugenics and the sort of Nazi philosophies that developed from that kind of, from that time. Um, you know, trying to make the the white man superior, basically. That's basically what that was the kind of agenda at play. It's part of the it was the previous Manifest Destiny agenda was similar to that in some senses, trying to push these Native Americans who they claimed were savages, which they weren't clearly. So, so the Smithsonian collected all of these skeletons from all over the country. Every time a skeleton was found, it would go to them for th further study. They'd go in a closet, and then this guy Hedgelika came in, and he. Well, no, it wasn't just him. It was I think it was happening before him as well, and it, it really peaked with him being there. But you know, people would like have their stuff collected by the. Smithsonian, uh, like a, a bone or a skeleton or a skull they found, and they would contact the Smithsonian and say, hey, can I get it back now? Can I, you know, what's happened with it? Oh, we've got no record of it. And that would be the general thing. There's no record of it. It'd be disappeared completely. So I, I can buy the, the idea that the Smithsonian were doing this part of some conspiracy to, to you know, help along manifest destiny, kick the Indians out of their, into the reservations, all of that kind of stuff. That all makes sense. But, but, you know, if this isn't just, a, a, you know, a unicorn-like fantasy based on a load of, you know, staggering number of hoaxes and bad reporting, then there's got to be a lot of giant skeletons hidden in many closets, you know. So, so, so you talked about this Nagbra thing, maybe, maybe they were all, you know, reburied re in 1990, but, but between 1910 and 1990, I think Manifest Destiny had pretty much been let go of, and, and also, um, the head of the Smithsonian was probably not a eugenicist between those times. So, so why didn't he let it go, for one? And two, um, America is not the only place with giants. And it's you know, not just the USA. I mean, all, the way, you know, all over the Americas and the rest of the world. So, so, so where are all those skeletons? What's going on? Yeah, well, in, in North America, I mean, literally there was there were ones on display in like, the, I know there was one in a, I think a dentist or a barber shop, I think somewhere in New England in Vermont. And this was like, I think an eight and a half foot skeleton. And it was just there for many years until, you know, and people didn't care about it. You know, that was that. There's a photograph of one from Steelville, I think Missouri, uh, which was, I think nine feet tall, just laying down next to someone. We found it on a microfilm and that was reported on. And so, yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch, there was, there, were, there was some bones and skeletons on display at the Maryland Academy of Sciences um, until 1990. And people just weren't interested, basically. There was no, I don't think there was any interest in it. They thought they were anomalies and left it at that. Uh, there's a few people wrote about them back then, like Brad Steiger um, and a couple of other kind of researchers, but no one, no one really thought much about it there was some on display actual kind of full burials it's kind of turned into a museum like mounds and stuff down in uh moundsville i think um and places like that uh i forget which exact state that's in but you know so and, and they were just lying there kind of like kind of kept and you could see them through the glass and stuff like that so you got things like that and there's postcards of these as well but it's, the thing is like many of them were like seven foot eight foot and you know, unless you're kind of analysing them and measuring them, it's hard to tell, you know, I think, how big they really were. I mean, in Britain, we've got just very few on display. There's the Bird Castle Giant up in Norfolk, which is, I think, oh, just over seven foot. There's another seven footer on display at Thirsk Museum in Yorkshire. There was another one in St Albans, which I think was just under seven foot. I think it's still on display there. And so there are a few here and there, but many of them were found so long ago. And there's a thing about kind of having human remains on display especially in north america is technically illegal that is a problem you know so we, we kind of like we've kind of like got highly frustrated by that side of it to be honest with you but so so in america um we have just a massive massive number of, of these skeletons which goes beyond the statistical likelihood of them being over seven foot which is the 0 0.00038 but in in you know these ones in the rest of the world uh like in the uk uh, are they so few and far between that this could just be the, you know, the hypertrophy of the pituitary gland, HGH, all of that kind of stuff? Or, or, or again, is it a kind of a race or a tribe or a, even a species of yeah, the giants? Well, that in Britain, yeah, it's, it's a bit, we're well, such a small country here, but there's, um, there's, it's such a large kind of long time frame as well it's, it's quite a challenge to kind of get your head around it because many of these are found literally at megalithic sites 
there's some of them are found at Iron Age sites, other ones are found at Mesolithic sites, so there's like thousands of years you're playing with here. Um, so it's, yeah, and we have like, um, if it's actual tribes, we don't know, but w what we, we find fascinating is the traditions, especially of in Wales and places like this, where they've, they've maintained these stories, which often I believe encode truth. I mean, there's evidence now that they found um, like the stories of Jack and the Giants, Jack the Giant Killer could be 5,000 years old. There's like scientific report done on that, I think two or three years ago. And, you know, on St. Michael's Mount where he was supposed to have existed, for instance, and he battled with this giant called Cormoran and defeated him there. On St. Michael's Mount in the uh, I think early 1800s, they found an eight foot skeleton inside the mount underneath the crypt. And this was documented, it's actually in, I got it up there, this National Trust archaeological report talking about it. And so you get you get things like that. It's like, what the hell? You know? So you've got these legends and you've got the giants in the same place, actual skeletons. And so that kind of intrigues me. There was a, a 10 foot giant skull on display at Keswick Museum for a long time. That was well documented. There was a giant rib up there. Um, the list goes on, but whether they were actual tribes, it's really hard to tell, but there's been like in America, we found burials where a majority of the people there are very, very tall compared to normal size. So, you know, you, you, it's just so random. It's really hard to kind of gauge because obviously lots has not been discovered. Lots hasn't been reported upon and which we, we don't know what's been exaggerated and what hasn't. And so we're just like, like we did with our previous book, we're just analyzing the data going as deep as we can we're trying to see if there's any truth in this i mean we've we've put a whole load of, like we did in our previous book we've debunked some very famous ones like the irish giant the 12th foot antrim giant we completely debunked that very easily actually once you start looking into it so we've gone into each and every account and tried to debunk them and some you can't and some you find more evidence i see so like oh there's other reports there's other people witnessed this you know and you've got people like you know, like in Salisbury, just near Stonehenge, just near here, you've got people like Sir Thomas Elliot, who was like a well-known scholar, antiquarian, and he wrote the Dictionary of all things. Um, he was a member of Parliament for Cambridge. He witnessed and wrote about a 14-foot, 10-inch skeleton found just down the road from here in the early 1500s, probably 1508, we think. This was also written about and reported on by William Camden. Also, um, John Leland, talked about it as well. These were very famous scholars, writers at the time. And so that, that really surprised us, you know, things like that. And then you have, um, you have similar kind of stories like that around the whole country. It's like, but when you get incredibly famous people at the time, highly respected people, they're not gonna just ruin their reputation by making stuff up. So that's what really compelled us when you start seeing that in the historical record. And yet, okay, so that exists. We have this historical record, we have skeletons, they're even on display in some places. Uh, the, the the mainstream um, archaeological you know societies whatever they they seem to have not paid this any attention at all they they either don't care or specifically ignoring it why should people care why why is it important to, to care about giants well I think that's... why not just regard them as you know freak anomalies that just happen to be I think most people do see them as freak anomalies I think that's just, that's the kind of general kind of rule but we're just fascinated because it's like a missing kind of part of our human history it's part of us you know we're probably related to these these people who were living back then so i think it's worth taking note and just observing it as an interesting sideline you know i don't we, we're not trying to force it upon anybody we're not saying believe us we think we're right you know we're just documenting everything we can going deep into it see what we can find debunking quite a lot of it to be honest with you but there's a lot we couldn't debunk and i don't think anyone else can it's like really interesting but there's very little evidence to you to work with and so this is why we like it when people like thomas elliott kind of specifically make measurements and they, they even talk about finding um there was like a strange book discovered in the burial that had this inscription on it. None of them could decode, not even Thomas Elliot, who was a well-known scholar. And there was this metal disc made of tin and lead with these unusual foreign inscriptions on it found in, or nearby. And so like, and this is back in the early 1500s. So you've got things like that. It's like, what the hell? That's and you've got the National Trust reporting on an eight-foot skeleton. 
Um, it's just utterly strange. We're I mean, on Lundy Island out in the Bristol Channel. We've got a uh, eight foot seven inch skeleton reported on, documented by 20 different publications, at least maybe 25. Um, academics were out there checking it out and stuff like that. Where the, where's the skeleton now? We don't know. But it's the same thing everywhere. So we, we, we find anomalies, but you know, the burials often as well are interesting because they appear to be highly revered people like people of valor, warriors, priestly elites, um, traditions of them being like, you know, like with Idris we find in Wales, like a holy astronomer, you know, that he would reign from his mountain top, things like this, and measure the land. And we're finding connections between different subjects that we, we started this interview with to do with geomancy and earth, earth energies and ley lines, all connected with the myths and stories of these giants. Like for instance, I'll just tell you this, because Idris, who was like the, the, he was a great king, he was supposed to be a king of Wales in the sixth century AD, but also in earlier traditions, he was known as Idris Gower, the giant Idris, Idris translates as Enoch, and he was supposed to be on this seat, Idris's seat, Cadet Idris, this mountain in North Wales in Snowdonia, where he would survey the land, be able to prophesize everything from the, when the world began to when the world ends using astronomical principles. You see, you have these myths, and then they found, actually at the base of the mountain in the 1600s, two seven foot skeletons, and one of them was buried with this hazel rod, which is traditionally a dowser's dowsing tool. And so you've got this geomantic connection directly being found in burials, linked with these myths, and it all just kind of starts you start seeing that there's a pattern here. And uh, so I think it's worth looking at these myths, especially these. Um, kind of ones that have been passed down for thousands of years, especially now there's proof of that with the Jack and the Giant stories. So yes, yeah, so you got things like that. And uh, so you're finding these mythological stories like on St. Michael's Mount, even at Stonehenge, for instance, as well. You know, you've got Idris, obviously, but at Stonehenge, that the earliest name of Stonehenge was the Giant's Dance or Quire Gigantum in Welsh, which means the Giant's Dance or the Giant's, so in other, other slight variation, it's the Council of the Giants. But then, you know, why is it called that? And why is it said, back in the 1100s, in Geoffrey of Monmouth's history of the Kings of Britain, that Giants bought the stones from North Africa to Ireland originally, then Merlin brought them over to Stonehenge. It's got a giant connection there. There's also a tradition written about in 1666 by uh, Reverend Robert Gay, who lived in Nettlecombe, Somerset, and he wrote that a tribe called the Kanjig Giants created and built Stonehenge as a trophy to their kind of uh, battle that they won and actually built it with them. So you've got multiple traditions of giants keep being linked with Stonehenge. And also in Salisbury, not just Thomas Elliot talking about a 14 foot 10 inch skeleton. Since 1447, I think, they've been parading a 22 or 24 foot effigy of a giant around Salisbury every year just after the summer solstice. So why on earth are they doing that? And then it became known as St. Christopher and everyone was like, who's St. Christopher? So we, we go into this in the book, the new book, and um, we realize, actually this is the article on the, on the website we put, we put for the Graham Hancock website, and uh, we realized that St. Christopher, the, the name that it was given, who's now been decanonized, was a giant, 18 foot tall Canaanite giant from the Bible lands, who was famous for carrying Jesus when he was a baby over a river. And it's also the patron saint of travelers and like exploration and things like this. And, you know, so why, why is there this strange connection with giants with Salisbury and discoveries have been found there? And you've got Stonehenge called the Giant's Dance. Is it all just coincidence? Is it all just kind of like myths and stories? Or is Tom Elliot, Thomas Elliot making it up? We also have another one in Salisbury just down the road of a nine foot four inch skeleton being found in 1719 in a mound that was called the giant's grave and so you know what do you make it? i don't know what to make of that it's like one of these it's too many of these little things so we just we, for us we just bring all the data together and we, we we're not pushing it on anybody we're not convinced by a lot of it but we we are absolutely think it's a great story and people should have a look at what is being compiled and make up their own minds well I think what you'd really like is that, you know, see top of the BBC and CNN giants found, you know, they officially existed. 
So, so you know, a lot of the book in, in, in Giants on Record, you, you talk about how many of the, the skeletons are found in mounds, you know, the burial mounds and that kind of stuff. Surely many of those unexcavated mounds still remain. And probably, are they being excavated now? Do you know? Um, uh, well, they, they, they were finding um, seven-foot skeletons up until the, I know, the 1980s, I think, in North America, in, uh, I think it was Oklahoma. Well, but, but, but why does it stop? I mean, you know, dinosaur bones are still being found, you know, regularly all the time. Um, why, why aren't giant bones still being found? Um, well, they found the dragon man skull, which is very interesting in China, even though it's been around for a while. Um, but, you know, but maybe they are being found. You know, that's the question. I mean, not everything gets reported upon. Why, why would it not be reported upon, though? I don't know. That's, a, that's one of the big question marks that we, we keep kind of challenged by. We don't know. We don't know why more of this isn't just public domain. Why isn't it just out there? Um, but we just, we don't know. And, and we're at a point where we just like, we're just pulling it all together. And we just want to kind of demonstrate that there's something here that's worth looking at. You know, whatever you believe, whatever, you know, whatever the academics say, we just wanted to kind of just pull all the data together, analyze it as closely as we could, especially in relation to the myths and the stories, because we believe there's a lot of truth in them. And I think, you know, if you look into the myths and the stories, often they're passed down very specifically, you know, very accurately, and they're deliberately rhymed so they don't get forgotten, so the same words are used, and they encode lots of information and histories, uh, which is often overlooked. And I think that's one of the areas that it's worth checking you know, worth people to look at more. Well, you know, having having read your your, your first giant book, Giants of Record, I, I find the evidence absolutely compelling, and I and I agree with you. Something is going on. There is definitely something going on. Um, but but I, you know, in order to convince other people who are maybe you know just listening and haven't haven't heard of this, that there are not just a lack of skeletons now. So we have this Nag Nagra thing. So they all they all got disappeared. But until that time, they're all hidden away and not being shown out, uh, not being, you know, they didn't unleash the horde of skeletons upon the public for some reason. We also have a, a lack of photos. I mean, there's, there's this one photo, what, from 1899 of, um, it was a Frederick Cook. Um, you put that on my dad's site, I think, um, and that, that's pretty compelling. He, he talks about there being a, a tribe of, what, seven and a half foot giants or something like that. But, but you know, from the mid-1800s, we got loads of photos of Geronimo. You got loads of photos of different different. Native Americans, why, why, why have we not got more photos of giants? No, there are a few. There are quite a few. Yeah, I mean, we put them, we put them in the book, the ones we found anyway. Um, but um, uh, we, we think it's partly uh, because I think from 1990, the Nagpa thing, um, it's illegal to even have photos published of them as well. Oh my God, what? Yeah, yeah. It's serious. They're really serious about this. And it's not just Native Americans, it's the federal government. And so we think that was partly... Um, responsible for getting them out of publications that had them in before that. And so they had to republish them and things like that. So that's why we think they were so hard to get. If we'd been doing it before 1990, it might have been a different story. Um, but and, but we've, we've been contacted by people who claim they've got stuff, but they're scared to send us photographs. Why? Because it's illegal. Because they could get arrested if they kind of if anything comes out about them having any bones or any photos of stuff like that. I mean, we we went to see a gentleman, myself and JJ, two years ago in um, California, South South California, going over to the Arizona area, and he claimed to have bones of a giant skeleton. And we went to see them, we witnessed them, we saw them, but he said that the only reason he could show us is because someone had classified them as bare bones like the bones of a bear. And that's the only reason he contacted us, because if they had been classified as human, they would have been taken away, he would have been arrested, because <laughs> he found them. And he found them in an area where we know a 12-foot giant was unearthed um, in the early 1800s near Lompoc, in uh, Southern California. So we went to see them, we, we photographed them. We, I mean, we've got, this was after the book came out. And we're concerned, because if they end up being human, then we're, we could get in trouble as well. So we, don't, we haven't even published it, you know, because we're concerned about that. So, but we don't know if they're human. We can't, we can't even really, in America, we can't get them analyzed legally. You know, it's not a thing you can do. So it's, it's a big problem there, you know. So, it can, so we've kind of like, we've stopped researching in America. We just stopped well, it, well, you know. Well, we, outside, we, what yeah. about outside of the United States, I mean, for example, um, you, well, in your book, you, you got, a, a, you know, a huge number of stories from, from, from North America. Um, they're, they're also the, the Mayans, the Aztecs. They were they were great at 
chronicling their knowledge of the, the world around them. They must have explored and known about giants if they were in North America at the time. Um, why aren't there like codices full of full of stories about giants? Or are there? Maybe there are. There are, yeah, yeah. There are. There's a Codex Vaticanus that, that shows um, a bunch of locals defeating a giant, killing him, cutting his guts open. It's pretty rough. We've got something like 20 accounts from Mexico, maybe 25, that we've just gathered over the years. Um, 10 foot tall, some of them. There's legends of the Quinametzin. These are or the Quinines. These are like a race of giants who existed in one of the earlier phases before the Olmecs, you know, and the Olmecs in some traditions were the ones who defeated them and actually took over the land. And um, and these are depicted, these are talked about in tradition. Cholula and Tiahuatacan were built by a race of giants. The Quinametzins were the builders and the architects. And so you have that in north, the very northern part, almost at the US border, you have the area of the Sonora Desert. And you have the Yaqui tribe, which is, I think, Carlos Castaneda and all that. But there's other tribes up there who, uh, and it was reported by uh, uh, someone called Paxton, I forget the surname, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, where they found these mummified remains of seven to eight foot tall skeletons reported on by, a, he was part of the Smithsonian. But... They never got into their publications. He just published it himself and put it out in all the news. We did a whole chapter on the Sonora Giants, I think, in, um, in our Giants on Record book. So you've got, uh, you have got stuff going on in that part of the country. There's been giant remains found in Baja California as well. Um, as well as there's a few accounts in the Yucatan. There's apparently a very tall skeleton on display in, in a museum near Capan in Honduras and things like this. And so you have, you seem to find it everywhere. You know, there's lots of these accounts, there's lots of these stories, there's lots of these skeletal remains reported in the press, in academic journals. It's the same principles everywhere. And uh, yeah, so it is there as well. It's, and, uh, and so I don't know about them going into North America and writing or talking about stuff like that, but there's, I think one of the most compelling, uh, the way of looking at it is these early explorers going in you know, and actually witnessing them and writing about them and experiencing them. I mean, there's a story even of them trying to sort of kidnap, I think, some giants and bring them back to Britain or Europe, but they died on, they died on the way back. And why didn't they keep the bones? <laughs> I guess a, rot, a rotting body yeah, on a small ship. A bit smelly, you know. And um, so you got, you know, crazy stories like that. So, yeah, so uh, to be honest with you, we don't know. A lot of it we just don't know how authentic these are, but we kind of feel compelled to piece it together and investigate them as closely as, as we can, because there's, there's a great story there. That there is. And well, w one of the stories in your book that I found quite interesting, it was, um, it was a Texas Ranger, Nelson Lee, and he wrote a book about how when he was captured by the Comanche, he lived, with, he lived among them and they told him their stories and they were talking about how before them there was a race of white skinned, bearded, 10 foot giants. Yes. Um, it, it, you know, take away the giant part, and it sounds a bit like the story of Atlantis. Um, is is that kind of your supposition that that that, that perhaps the Atlant Atlantean myth and the, the giant stories are, are one story together? Or? Well, I mean, Jim Vieira, he's the Atlantologist around here. Um, he's not here at this present moment, but he he's convinced. I mean, if you look into that, I mean, if you look into the me more metaphysical side of it, the more kind of theosophical side, they all all these kind of um, traditions they have you know these esoteric groups talk about there were giants in atlantis edgar casey talks about this you've got the theosophists and other people and they were around they were like the that's where it all began kind of thing and then they emerged in different parts of the world but i don't really personally go along with that too much some elements of it which fascinate me the myth mythological sides of it but if you look in north america i mean you have not just them talking about this previous civilization there's other myths other stories of these native american tribes and this is ross hamilton again and vine deloria jr who's an absolute genius he was a native american scholar and writer and activist here he was a mentor to ross hamilton who's been our mentor so we've got this kind of interesting kind of feed of information that's been collected like orally over the years and they talk about um and you can see this in the historical record as well these lots of accounts of these fierce red-haired or black-haired bearded very pale skinned often with freckles and ruddy skin especially in the western parts and some of the northern parts of north america and some of them 
going back, we're talking over 10,000 years. And they would terrorize the locals. We have the whole story of the Paiute tribe up in Nevada, and they were terrorized by these giants called the Saiti Ka, who were, which translates as either tool eaters or, or flesh eaters, according to some accounts. And they were around Lovelock Cave, and there's a whole story that they got burnt out, they got destroyed by all the locals because they were being eaten, literally eaten cannibal style by them. And so, and then they found a whole bunch of skeletons that back this up, a whole bunch of bones, mummified remains, that later on, you know, hundreds of years after the the myths had been written down, you know, so so you get things like that. And uh, and you've got petroglyphs up in that area called the Winnemucca petroglyphs. And these are huge, super-sized, really high up places, these giant, beautifully carved petroglyphs. And they're up to 14,000 years old. So who was carving them? You know, we have to question that. And that traditionally, that was the area of where the giants lived and resided before the Paiutes came in you know, a couple of thousand years ago or so. So, yeah, things like that are really, really interesting to me. But also, we're finding connections, a lot of connections, between North America and Britain. You know, J.J. Ainsworth, who's been doing some brilliant research, and she's found... The petroglyphs at Winnemucca, which are this super ancient date, are identical to ones found in the Boyne Valley of Ireland, specifically Loch Roo. And like, how is this possible? There's five or six exact symbols that design, almost like the same hand put them together. Well, the ones in Winnemucca are giant sized and much older. And the descriptions of the people from the area, the Paiute talked about, they seem like they're giant Irish people. And you've got other tribes like the Duhair and I think the Carolinas who have like elements of the Welsh and Irish in their language. And so you're finding these strange connections. There's even an account we, we put in the new book where Christopher Columbus, when he was in Galway Island, like five years before he set sail to America, he witnessed two extremely tall Native Americans, and they were described as robust, extremely tall. We've got all the data in here. And this is from Christopher Columbus's diaries, for God's sake. And uh, they worked out that they floated over on a raft from America because the the, uh, the way the you know the sea you know, brings people over from certain directions at specific times of year, the, cur the currents, go, they just easily made their way over here. And so we couldn't believe it when we found that out. Um, so what's going on there? Does that prove that there may have been earlier kind of people coming over easily from America and actually influencing people in Britain? Another thing in Ireland, in uh, the Ulster region, Northern Ireland, we find something called the AIP gene. This is similar to the whole gigantism, acromegaly type thing, but a bit different. And they found this specific area where people like Charles Byrne and many of the living giants from the last few hundred years come from. And still today, that's the tallest people in the Europe emerge from this specific spot in Ireland. And it's still, being, it's still prevalent there. But they say it began at least... 2,500 to 3,000 years ago, this gigantism suddenly started appearing in this part of Ireland. And then you look at the myths of Ireland and it talks about these incomers called like the Fomorians, the Tuatha Dee Danann, um, sorry, Tuatha Dee Danann, I've been corrected on that, and like the Firbolg coming in from these lost sunken lands to the west and bringing these arts of civilization with these giant genes. And there's proof that a giant gene emerged there two and a half, three thousand years ago. So you've got little things like that which don't make sense, but the myths are kind of matching genet genetics almost. Well, you, you were talking about the, 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 the redhead tribes in North America and, and, and uh, how they were cannibals and they sounded quite barbaric. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, my dad's work has all been about this, this lost civilization, this progenitor civilization. Maybe it seeded the people in Ireland, maybe it seeded the people in North America, who knows? One, one possibility, but but you know this Comanche story of this uh, this guy um, Nelson Lee. He talks about the, the, this uh, lost race of giants as being very highly advanced. Um, you know, much more advanced than the Europeans who 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 who'd come in to, to displace the Native Americans. Um, is is does that seem to be uh, true based on what you've seen around all of these giant skeletons and, and you know your research into giants? Are were they an advanced people? Or were they pretty much on par with their with their you know regular height peers um, at the time? Well, in, in America, I mean, you've got it's all different. I mean, you've got some areas like the whole Saiti car thing in Nevada. They seem to be cannibalistic. Um, 
terrorize us. There's also these traditions in the Europe mountains and in California of these stone giants who had such tough skin. It was like it was made of stone. So you fire an arrow at them and it wouldn't penetrate them. And so, and they think they actually did that by rolling around in like sort of you know, rock dust to kind of rub it on their skin to make it really tough. And they would terrorize and eat the locals. And like, um, and there's, numerous myths and legends that talk about this. And then you have other areas like the Mount culture people, um, some of the early Mount, the Adena specifically, they were very sophisticated groups of giants, tribes of giants, elite groups who would, as I mentioned, were breeding between other elite groups who were very sophisticated into astronomy, geomancy, geometry, laying out things in the landscape, harmonizing the whole kind of um, landscape affecting the weather, bringing rain through different dances and ceremonies and shamanic practices. So you got that, and you got the kind of cannibalistic tendencies in different areas and different times. Same thing in Britain as well. We have all these stories of like Gog Magog and these cannibalistic giants and other such things. But at the same time, you got like the giant Idris, or you've got like the giants of Stonehenge who were like master builders and surveyors and like trying to bring harmony to the land and feed their people and like were renowned kings and leaders. So you've got like the same principles. You've got all these kind of, they're different. You know, you get like the very advanced and you get the very kind of savage aspects uh, documented through mythology and also being proven through some of the kind of archeology span as well. Mm. So you, you have, um, you know, so many stories from, from North America of these giants, but, but also, you know, across the world, I don't know whether you found giant skeletons in the rest of the world, but there are stories of giants in the rest of the world. I mean, the Norse have the, uh, you know, the, the Vikings, they have the, the Jotuns in, in Greece, we have the, the Titans and the Cyclops and then the Anunnaki in, in um, Sumeria. And then in the Bible, of course, we've got all these, these stories. You talked about the Canaanites before and the Anakites, and I know in your book you've got a list a mile long of, of uh, giants within the Bible. Um, both tribes and individuals. There's the notable ones, or Gog and Magog, uh, Goliath, of course, King Og with his 13 foot bed, all that kind of stuff. The the, the most interesting part of all of this giant stuff it, uh, within the Bible is is the Nephilim. Um, so so, what does it say? The sons of God mated with the daughters of men. Um, what's your take on all of that? Is is your take that the, this was you were talking about? What was it? The the height the the uh, Homo hydra hydrapagensis hydrapagensis or hydrapagensis yeah. is your is your is your take that they or the Denisovans or something like that were were the Nephilim that were mating with the humans or what, what, what's your what? I don't know I don't I don't think the Nephil uh, the Nephilim are Denisovans or Homo hydrapagensis or hydrapagensis pagensis I don't think they're the same I think they're much older the much much earlier people the, the whole story in the Bible is fascinating I mean we we cover it briefly in our previous but we talk about it in the new book because because we think there's, there are connections between that area and this area with the fact that there's stone circles in both areas, there's dolmens in both areas, there's appears to be a Canaanite St. Christopher very close to Stonehenge, a tradition that goes back to the 1400s. But with the whole story of the Nephilim, what's interesting about them is that they were the offspring of the Watchers or the Anunnaki, specifically the Watchers who are uh, the second or third group who came down from Mount Hermon or came down from the sky in some traditions, bred with human women. And they were the original Anunnaki, the kind of Enlil and Enki became frustrated with these Watchers because they were interacting with humans, giving away all their secrets. And these secrets include like the secrets of agriculture, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, metalwork, stone architecture, construction techniques, things like this. And they bred with these human women, apparently, gave birth to these Nephilim, who then became this even larger race, these very tall, robust, powerful, but also unruly, savage, and cannibalistic as well. And these were the ones who continued and took all this knowledge and, and gave it to humanity. And the Watchers didn't want that. The, the, sorry, the original Anunnaki didn't want that. So this is, in, in a, according to proper translations, they claim that this is why the flood occurred, the Great Flood. It was to delete and get rid of the Nephilim. We have almost exactly the same tradition of Viracocha 
in South America, where he created a race of giants from the earth to help build the megalithic sites, but they became unruly cannibalistic. He created a flood and destroyed them with that. So you get the same stories in different areas. We have flood myths in Britain as well, linked with giants, the same kind of thing. And so it's thought that some people suggest, no, we're not, we don't really promote this idea, but some people have suggested that the Nephilim then fled the survivor Nephilim fled and spread the megalithic building knowledge and their genes ended up in Britain and other places like North America. That's the kind of story that some researchers have put forward. We kind of, there's elements of it that make sense, but, but they, this, that's not the whole story. It's one part of the giant story, in my opinion. So if they were real, if these stories are true, then that would make sense. And so, but again, we take, you have to take these stories seriously, in my opinion, especially things like the Book of Enoch, because he was like documenting what was going on. He wasn't just, I don't think he was making stuff up too much. And there's even talk of them coming, you know, the Watchers bringing over Enoch to Britain, potentially. And even according to Robin Heath and uh, the authors of Uriel's Machine, they believe that Actually, they were at Stonehenge, possibly building Stonehenge and making observations from it, even Newgrange as well. We have similar kind of stories of these people arriving with this knowledge and everything else. And so it's very odd, you know, when you start looking into these stories. I mean, it's hard to prove anything, you know, because there's not, there isn't archaeological evidence. But DNA and genetic movements across the planet are starting to reveal that there are connections with these different parts of the world. Well, the, the activities of these giants, you were talking in your new book, is, is about um, how they seem to be building megaliths. Now, you, you obviously, was it say your t-shirt? Is that megalithomania? That's, that's the Stonehenge. There you go. Yeah, yeah megalithomania. So, so you, you host this megalithomania conference. You're obviously fascinated with megaliths. So, so is your supposition that the, the giants were building Stonehenge, you were saying they built Teotihuacan, um, is this, is this uh, same myth kind of everywhere in the world, you know, in Japan, the Jomon megaliths, were they also built by giants? Or, I don't know, there's megaliths in every part of the world. Is, is this story yeah. common or is this is this unique? It's surprisingly common, yeah. I mean, there's a huge, I mean, a lot, I think a lot of it is just people trying to understand because they've kind of lost the, the actual truth of who really built them. So they kind of suppose, well, it must have been built by giants. Who else could have done it? That's the general thinking of academia about why they're called that. But you actually find we've actually got giant skeletons being dug up in some of these places you know that's the less that's, that's where it gets weird actually inside stone circles like glen quicken in scotland for instance they found a giant skeleton inside the stone circle buried deep under it and we're like whoa that's strange and uh and so yeah these myths of them creating the sites are very strong everywhere and we're not just talking about them being the architects and builders but actually they encode stories in the myths of how they did it and how they placed them across the landscape, the geomantic principles, where there's a giantess myth that we find all over Britain and in other parts of the world of the apron full of the giantess, where she would begin her journey going to another spot she was supposed to be going to, but she'd get disturbed or she'd get trip over or apron stirrings will break and the stones will fall at specific spots along this dead straight alignment and that's where that site was built and so they're encoding the way they're placing the sites in the landscape in, in these stories and often they're into triangles very specific numbers and distances encoded within these stories and so when you've got things like that you kind of have to take note you know were there you know with the big question did giants really build them you know perhaps you know, if there were giants around, if they were actual, you know, they're going to be super strong, much more robust. They can easily carry stones compared to the little people, the normal sized people. So that, that, that's the basics of it. They could have done that. And there's just, I mean, I think something like, I mean, as far as we're aware, they're like the amount of stories, creation stories of sites are linked with giants is like, I think, more than any other theory, you know, any other folklore story. And so, you know, why would that be? Is it just so they can just explain it's the only way they can think of it could have been done? Or is there something else in that based upon what we've uncovered? Well, you know, uh, the, the, these, these megaliths, you know, whether it was giants or not that were building them, um, the effort that goes into building them is, uh, you know, absolutely staggering. You know, they're big, heavy stones and they're, they're, they obviously had a really good reason to build them. 
all over the world, but it's really not obvious what that reason is. Um, you know, the, the, could it be just a, a sacred space for worship? Maybe, but the, you know, the, typically the, the indigenous people who, who are around at the time, indigenous animistic beliefs were prevalent and, and animistic belief says that, you know, that special rock over there is, is sacred. That waterfall is sacred. If you have that, why do you need to go and build a giant place like Stonehenge if you've already got a sacred waterfall or a sacred rock? So, you know, if they, they're already perceiving the, them in nature, what, what the hell were they doing building them? What, 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 what do you think is going on? Whether it's people or giants, what, what's your take on, on? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the use of these sites is what you're talking about. I mean, and why they would bother doing it because it's such a task. I mean, you look at the pyramids, I mean, for God's sake, I mean, it's just ridiculous. You, you know, that they did it though, and they wanted it to last. And I think that's one of the, one of the reasons is that they wanted them to last, to be monuments to their, um, skills to their culture at the time because they knew they probably foresaw like idris did that things won't survive our culture won't live on forever something will decimate us and remove us from this the historical timeline not just you know old age but actually the whole culture will go and so they wanted to record where they were at inside these temples that they would also use at the time obviously for ceremonies they would use them as astronomical kind of you know devices they would use them i think as well to attract and stimulate energy at these sites because they, they understood the principles of geomancy and earth energies and it would become ag agricultural fertility generators and so these were built with compassion for future generations to be able to use them and so i think there's also they were like marker points on a on a trackway system across the country they were used for navigation they were used for um um multiple different purposes i think and this, this would depend on the individual cultures kind of primary needs at the time and i think they were practical and i think they were kind of spiritual and ceremonial all all at once so so you, you said that, that they were built with compassion for future generations to use them now here we are uh, as inheritors of these things um what do we do what do we, how do we use them how, what, what do we well, do i think it's a case of like you know the, if you if you if they're smart enough, which they were, they were gonna they weren't gonna rely on the language they were speaking to last to communicate okay. through time. You can only really communicate, I think, through time through things like mathematics, geometry, geodesy, which is the placement of where it is on Earth in the landscape, because they clearly could measure the Earth. That's without doubt, and also they're generators of energy. And so as long as the earth spins and the sun rises, there's going to be energy available. And like, so these were designed to manipulate and expand that energy. And it wasn't just, this has been proven actually by John Burke and Michael Persinger and other researchers that the energy that can be manipulated and created in ancient sites and still are today, you know, often there's rock art sites where it's marking a spot where there's a high magnetic energy and it affects your pineal gland and you have visionary consciousness expanding experiences but the fertilizing energy being produced by these sites is also affects your consciousness it's the same kind of thing it's the same kind of same energy but has different effects on seeds and grains as it does on the human brain and pineal gland and so forth and so i believe that they were um it was a uh, to expand consciousness and to keep consciousness at a higher level because they knew there were going to be dark periods in Earth's history, where it would go down and then come back up and things like this. So it was their way of saying, this is where we're at, this is the peak we reached. Try and stay there, people, in the future. <laughs> I think that may be part of it. And I think um, these giants weren't just, you know, even if whether they were giant human beings or whether they were giants, you know, in skill, wisdom, intelligence, and other such things, they may have been revered because of what they knew. You know, and like, and I think that's why they may have been called giants in some cases. They might not have been physical giants, but they might have been as well, you know, because you have so many kind of all this evidence kind of congregating linked with these sites. So, Hugh, um, this has been, uh, you know, a fascinating uh, discussion, fascinating stuff in the books. Uh, it's it's uh, incredible, the, the, the idea of this, and, and you've done an incredible job putting it all together. Um, you know, I'm excited to read your new book. I haven't, it just uh, as a last thing, is there anything in there that you'd like to, to uh, you know, 
to say about in this book you mean in this book <laughs> that exact book there's the new one. to be honest with you there's a ridiculous amount of stuff we've, we've compiled into this book it's taken us like years to put that together and um i think we covered some good stuff i mean i think i'm fascinated by the geomantic aspect i think that's one of the primary things we've kind of kind of pulled out of all this stuff but we have to credit anthony roberts i want to mention him because he wrote a book called sowers of thunder in 1978 and he was the first to really put forward this idea that these giant myths and stories encoded this geomantic information which can only be only could really start to be understood because of the study of earth mysteries that had emerged in the 60s and 70s and so we kind of and we've kind of taken that on We've dedicated the book to Anthony Roberts, actually. He was a Glastonbury-based guy. He died in 1990. And so that side of it, to us, is very interesting. Something I'm working on with JJ as well as Jim because we're finding so much with that that we're able to trace it back to Mother Goddess traditions going back t tens of thousands of years, potentially. And this apron full, this kind of mythos, is there's a whole other element to that. So that side of it really gets me. But I think it's also a case of, like, we are you know much we're very inspired by graham hancock you know just so you know he's he the way he approaches the ancient mysteries the trying to understand and, and unlock the secrets of this lost civilization is something that's the kind of approach we take we believe there's missing chapters in human history and this is one of them and so we're just kind of taking that approach and, it, and like i said and i think like graham he's not trying to force an idea upon you he's not trying to kind of make you believe it he's just presenting this amazing amount of research from all these different disciplines into one and i think you can um i think that's the best way to do it and i think you know we've tried to approach it the same way and i think people are going to enjoy this book i mean some of it we we probably have too many accounts but we wanted to make it comprehensive we wanted to like put it all down because we have maps of each area so people can go out to their giant sites they can check out these graves of where this 15 foot skeleton was this mythological figure was said to be buried they can go to this museum where there was bones on display and things like that so we you know we think it's a i think we think it's worth investigating and we think there's more to come from ancient britain when it comes to the giants and the connection with ancient sites i agree well, Hugh, thank you so much. And uh, for people listening who who are interested in this topic, please read uh, Giants on Record and Hugh's new book, which uh, I'm excited to read, Giants of Stonehenge and Ancient Britain, which should be a more comprehensive, updated version of, of the giant story. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, honestly, Giants on Record was a really, really interesting, fascinating book. And I'm, I'm looking forward to read the new one. So thank you, Hugh.